All right, let's do this. This is our last lecture of the quarter. It's uh, Friday of week 10 or 11 or something. I don't know what number. Um, the final exam is three days from now. It's Monday morning, the 11th, at 8.30 in the morning. I'm really sorry about that time. Uh, quick story, like I don't pick the exam times. The way that it works is normally the university just picks, you know, but we in the CS classes, particularly in the 106s, we were getting a lot of issues where students would have other exams at the same time as our exams. And our classes are really big, so we'd have like 50 people with exam conflicts. It was always a really big logistical problem, right? So we actually went to the university and we complained and we said, hey, can you help us with this? So they said, okay, what if we carve out a time slot that's like just for you guys, you know? You can have your own time slot. Like no one else has finals during that slot. You just won't have any of these conflicts anymore. We were like, that's great. And then they always fuck us and give us eight in the morning. <laughs> They're like, oh, you want a time slot? Here's your time slot. <laughs> so like if you, if you just search for like Stanford final exams or whatever, exam schedule, then what you find is like they have this little table somewhere. I don't know if where's the, um, maybe this one. So like here, they, put, they always put us in the very first time slot. And uh, <laughs> so whatever. I mean, I, there's a few other people that get to be in there, but it's mostly just us. But they always give us this very, very early final exam time. So sorry about that. Um, that's just what we have to live with. So that's really soon. That's just three days from now. My guess is that given all the other stuff you guys have had to work on, that you may not have had a ton of time to study yet. Hopefully you can set aside some time this weekend to work on it. Your homework uh, eight, Stanford one, two, three, is due tonight at six. Um, we had our last night of layer last uh, evening, yesterday evening, Thursday night. So if you want help with Stanford one, two, three, um, I would suggest using the Piazza forum or email or contacting section leader, that sort of thing. So hopefully you guys will be able to get that finished up soon. Um, Anyway, so yeah, our final exam is next Monday morning. I want to talk about that a little bit today. And then I've got a few slides I'll run through quickly just kind of about some stuff you might choose to do in the break or, or, or after this class and, and so forth. So that's the plan for today. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, who, raise your hand if uh, my final <laughs> is the final or project end of the quarter uh, thing that you're most uh, nervous about this fall. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm just curious, if you didn't raise your hand, then what, what are you more scared of than me? Math 51. Math 51, I heard physics. Physics 61, anybody else? CS 103, anything else? Yeah, math 51, math 61, physics 61. Okay, so I have to aspire to match these people. <laughs> Okay, well, I will, I will look at what they're doing and I'll try to see, you know, we'll see what I can do about that. But, um, so let me, just, let me just briefly talk about the final. Um, if you haven't looked yet, you know, there's a bunch of final exam resources that have been posted on our exams page, kind of like we did with the midterm. So if you click on the exams page, uh, we have the, um, the syntax reference sheet, if you want to look at like what is going to be on that, that's going to be stapled to the back of your test, just like it was on the midterm. Uh, we've got three practice exams, number one, two, three. And the problems are all, uh, you know, you can look at the problems and an answer key. You can look at the problems in code step by step and type in an answer to see if your answer solves the problem correctly. Um, all the problems should be in there, at least all the code writing problems should be in there. And uh, if you somehow finish all these problems and you want more problems, well, I mean, the code step-by-step -step site is one place you could look. It has a lot of problems in these general categories. Maybe pick a category that you want more practice on, like graphs or, you know, binary trees or whatever it is. You can just go click on that category and step-by-step -step and you can do some more problems. Um, the section handout from this week is a, sec is a review for the exam also. So those are also additional problems and also just going back to previous sections. I'm sure there's some problems in there that you maybe didn't have time to solve before. You could go look at those. So I'm hoping that you won't sort of run out of materials to study from. And like in terms of, you know, what, what's the most helpful thing you can do with your study time, I really think just doing practice problems is the number one thing. I, I see people who ask like, should I go read book chapters? Should I go back and watch lecture videos? And that stuff is all fine too, but really I think just, just like building your muscles, getting pumped up, you know, like working on these problems is the way to do it. 
Um, you know, working on that, the practice problems, I think, is the best way to get ready. And, I mean, look, I'm not that creative of a guy. I just kind of look at all the old problems and I think of a new one and it's usually pretty similar to the old problems. So if you can solve all these, you're probably in pretty good shape for the real test. Um, in terms of the topics that might be on the test, if you haven't read them, down here I have a list. If you scroll down a little bit, it has a list of topics. Um, I might still ask you about linked lists, recursion, or backtracking. Let me make this a little bit bigger uh, here. There, linked list. So no, I asked you about linked list on the uh, midterm, but that was just like a little picture of nodes, like make this picture into this picture, you know. On the final, I might potentially ask you to write a method that takes a front pointer and manipulates a chain of nodes, which might be a little harder. So you might want to study that. Um, I still expect you to know recursion and backtracking. Uh, binary trees, you know, here's a pointer to a root of a tree. I want you to manipulate the tree. Um, talking about how to implement a structure, like if I say, hey, we're going to implement a, a class that's a stack or a queue or a list or something like that, I would hope you could talk about how to do that. Um, graph problems, like usually I'll hand you a basic graph object and I'll ask you to perform some search or some kind of manipulation on the graph. Um, and that includes some of, the, some of the path searching algorithms that we learned, like Dijkstra, A star, and also Chris Gall's minimum spanning tree algorithm. Uh, and I also talked about some material kind of late in the quarter that wasn't on the homeworks, like the uh, searching and sorting, or I guess sorting mostly, the, the different sorting algorithms that we learned about. And we also learned about some inheritance and things like this. And so I might ask you a question that involved using inheritance. So those are kind of all the different topics. And if you uh, look at these different finals here, I think you'll find that they kind of hit a different subset of these topics. Like not every single topic is represented on every practice test, but I'm trying to give you an example because some quarters I do or don't include different problems. And so that, you know, that will give you different uh, examples of things that you might want to practice. So um, yeah, those are the topics. Uh, if you want to know about things you don't need to study for, there's some of that listed down here too. I'm not going to make you draw any fractals. I'm not going to make you do operator overloading. I'm not going to make you do um, uh, the STL stuff, the, the standard C++ stuff that we learned uh, Wednesday, um, all these different things. I'm not going to make you do any of those advanced binary trees that were taught while I was gone, like the auto balancing, rotating trees, red, black trees, all that kind of stuff. Um, I wanted to know if you guys have any questions about the final, um, about what is or isn't expected or covered or I don't know anything, just any questions you might have about the exam. Yes? Along the questions, references like the sort of specific, I guess, data If a question, like you're talking about something like implementing a data structure like that or something, if a question talks about implementing a structure, I'll give you the um, header, the H file basically of that structure. So you'll know what methods it has and you'll know what private data that it has. And so hopefully, and the, the question will hopefully, you know, verbally describe like what the collection is as well. So I'm, I'm hoping that would be enough context that you would understand like what the nature of the collection is or what the problem is talking about. You know? Uh, there was another question, uh, yeah. What did we really need to understand sorting? Uh, like sort yeah, how, uh, what do you need to know about sorting? Well, I think looking at the practice exams is a good starting point. Um, so for example, sometimes I'll give you an array or a vector of data and I'll say, well, if you were going to do a selection sort on this array, the selection sort makes these sweeps across the array over and over, what would the array look like after you make three of those sweeps? Is it this or this or this? And one of them is the right one or something like that. Now that's fairly simple, but you can't do it if you don't know the algorithm. So, uh, or same thing with merge sort. Like maybe, you know, if you split apart the arrays and you merge them back together, like which of these pictures most look like what that would be, that kind of thing. Um, and that, that's kind of like the, the level that I want you to understand these would be like uh, kind of being able to trace through the execution of the algorithms that we discussed in class. Uh, I won't make you write a function that's one of these algorithms. You have to implement it completely in C++. Uh, I do have one. I believe it's on practice exam three. I'd have to look to be sure. Um, where uh, that one, what I do is I say, well, what if I had selection sort, but I modified it in the following way? What would that do to the big O of the algorithm? You know, sometimes I ask questions like that. that like I'm seeing if you understand that nature of the algorithm, what's the big O of the algorithm, some of this kind of stuff. So that's what I would expect you to know about those. Does that answer your, your question? 
What else? Yeah. Uh, would Big O be of any concern on questions that don't like specifically ask about him? Like, I mean, he's like Big O. Yeah, do you have to worry about big O? Well, um, <clears throat> in general, like you guys know, I think that uh, on the exam questions that you have to write code, mostly I don't care about your style. I don't care about your variable names, your indentation, your, your uh, redundancy, things like this, right? The only time that I care about your um, style or your nature of your code is when I feel like you're kind of trying to get around the way that I want you to solve the problem. So, for example, if you're doing a linked list problem and I want you to walk across the list and manipulate it or something, one thing you could do is you could copy the whole linked list into a vector and then do all the stuff I asked you to do on the vector and then put it back in the linked list. And then you basically converted my problem into a vector problem. And it's like, hey, I don't want you to show me you can do a vector. I want you to show me you can do a linked list. So sometimes when I say, well, I don't want you to use an auxiliary structure here, that's what I'm trying to get you to solve it in a way that you demonstrate the concept I want to test you on, right? So by the same token, sometimes I'll say, well, you need to solve this problem in big O of n squared time or better. And that's not particularly because I'm trying to quiz you on big O. It's because there's some shitty solution that's like end of the fifth where you do a million loops and then you eventually solve it, but it's like really bad algorithm and it's totally not the right way I want you to try to solve it. So if I have anything about big O on those questions, it'd be more like that to try to constrain you from doing a really wacky solution. Um, but in general, I, if I ever say anything about big O, I'm gonna bound it in a way that's reasonable where you could pick a reasonable structure and algorithm and you, the algorithm will be okay for the big O that I need from you. So yeah, I think big O will be more incidental to the problem. Did you have a question also? Yeah, um, I wanted to know, do we not have to know how to do operator mobility at all, or just the equal sign? Oh, 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 maybe I spoke uh, a little bit imprecisely. Uh, so I was talking about overloading operators, and there are some operators I don't care at all about. There's some material about forbidding copying of a class. And that involves an equals operator and stuff, and I don't care if you know about that. But I, I sometimes ask you these questions to write a class or to do inheritance or whatever, and occasionally those I have you write a less than less than to like print an object <coughs> or something like that. So uh, I would say that it, there are some of those basic operators that I would potentially ask you to write. Of course, like always, we're not super duper duper concerned with the minuscule syntax issues, so if you forget an ampersand somewhere or whatever, like. You know, that's not going to be the majority of what we're scoring you on, right? But, yeah. Uh, any other questions about the final? Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I'm listening to you. Um, so how do I test you on like Dijkstra and A-star? Well, if I remember correctly, and I don't always because I am fairly old, but um, uh, I think that some of the graph algorithms are on your reference sheet on the back page, right? So here they are. So I'm not particularly going to ask you to recite Dijkstra's algorithm because I'm giving that to you, right? <laughs> um, but I mean, despite the fact that I'm giving it to you, I might show you a graph and say what vertex would Dijkstra visit or what path would Dijkstra find? And you might say, well, isn't that easy to answer if you have this? And it's like, well, if you never learned Dijkstra's algorithm and you gotta like read this to learn what it is, that's a pretty time compressed thing to do. And, and so I still, I, I still think that you would wanna know those algorithms even if you have this uh, in front of you. So, so yeah, I mean, I expect you to be familiar with them and be able to like look at a graph and sort of <coughs> talk about what those algorithms would do if you ran them on that graph. But I don't expect you to completely memorize them cold. Because as you know, you're not supposed to bring all your notes and stuff. So without your notes, I would find it hard to memorize all that stuff. Right? Okay. These are all great questions. Any other questions about the exam? Yeah? This is kind of not directly about the exam, but um, for uh, our grades, um, I know right after the midterm, we like had a link to figure out like, what percent we were on each portion of the grade, like homework, um, et cetera. So after, um, is there a way to like get that updated information now or will that be released again after the exam? 
Yeah, so um, he's asking about the, the sort of that web page where you could look up your scores after the midterm. And actually some students have said to me like, hey, my page is out of date, it's missing, it doesn't update with my new scores and stuff, right? And, and I think the reason for that is because like I have to run a bunch of code on the grade database to get that page. And so I don't want to like rerun that thing every day to update it or whatever. I ran it that time to give you some mid-quarter stuff yeah. so you could tell like the drop date was coming, am I in trouble, should I think about whatever, that kind of thing, right? I wanted to help you make that decision. Um, and But I will, nevertheless, I will uh, re-update that page after all the grades are all done, all the final exams are graded, all the homeworks are graded, because I want you guys to have like a full like audit of like everything that we have for you how you got the score you got, what your sort of general ranking or percentile was roughly in the class, and then what kind of letter grade that leads to. And you'll also see that same letter grade come in on your uh, access and all that stuff on your, on your university uh, you know, logins that you do. So yes, I will update that page after the exams are graded. And also then if there's mistakes in it or errors, whatever, that's a good way for you to check and see them and help us fix them and stuff like that. But that'd be, I, I think we, you know, the exam's Monday, I think we're gonna grade them on like Wednesday or Thursday, I forget. And so probably around that weekend, maybe I'll have that page. Um, the, you know, cause I gotta give the SLs some time to like grade all the homework eights that you haven't even turned in yet, you know? So <laughs> I can't, I can't get the, I, I would love to tell you like Monday night what letter grade you're getting in the course, but I won't have all the data yet. So probably, you know, the end of that week, roughly I'll have all that for you. Yep. Anything else about the exam? Okay, I will try my best to write you guys a fair test that will challenge you but will not be frustrating or unfair or upsetting or whatever. Uh, I know tests are stressful um, and like I guess I could relieve that stress by canceling the test or something but I'm, I'm not even close to nice enough to do something like that. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, I, I, I know that that's not fun for you guys. So I'm gonna try to, I mean, what I try to do to make tests a little bit less nightmarish is to just give you a lot of practice problems. And then hopefully the real test is at least mostly like those problems so that you kind of know what you're gonna see, you know what you're gonna get. Hopefully not too many surprises on test day and so forth. Um, it's kind of hard to, to guarantee that, but I try, try to guarantee it as much as I can. So hopefully it'll be all right, and if the scores are too low, if the test is too hard, I'll curve the scores up and it'll be all right, we'll figure it out. <laughs> if the test is too easy and the scores are too high, so be it, you can have your high scores. Yes. Uh, I only curve up, I don't curve down. Yes? Um, with the practice, for, for the midterm, the practice midterms that were, on, that were posted online had more questions than we have on the actual midterm, but the questions in the actual midterm were a, bit, a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Is that really So I'll, I, he's, if, if I'm just repeating for the video pickup. Uh, is asking like, on the midterm there were more problems, but they were shorter, and on the real on the practice ones there were more problems, but they were shorter, and on the real midterm there were fewer problems, but they were bigger or longer, more difficult. Um, will I do that on the final also? Uh, you know, I'm not certain yet. I haven't finalized the exact list of problems yet. I'm still tweaking it, but that that is sometimes something that I do where all the practice tests will have 12 problems and then the real test has 10 or whatever and then it's almost like I traumatized you thinking there's gonna be 12 and then you're grateful to get 10 instead of pissed off that you got 10 or whatever. It's all about expectation setting, right? Um, sometimes I do that and sometimes I don't. I, I, I think in general what I would say is I, I try not to have the real final have more problems than the practice ones. Um, some people sometimes say that they felt that the real test was harder than the practice test or something like that and I, I know that's sometimes true I, I don't want that to be true, but it sometimes is, because I just have to like think up these problems, and sometimes you think up a problem that's harder or whatever. But um, So my goal would be the number of problems will be less than or equal to these, and that the sort of sum of the difficulty will be as close to equal or roughly-ish as I can, although I can't guarantee perfection of that, right? And of course, I don't guarantee the difficulty will be equal, but I do guarantee that if the difficulty is too much and it's harmful and your scores are low, that I will adjust up to fix it, right? That's, that's the best I can give you. So, um, yeah, anything else? You guys got big brains, I know you got this. They tell you that, that um, if you tell your students that they can do it, then it actually is measurably, it raises their scores, you know? So I think that you can do it. <laughs> it's easier to grade high score tests, so I just want the grading to go fast. So do well, make it easy for me. Um, 
<laughs> okay, so yeah, that's the final, you know, set aside some time this weekend, study, and uh, I'll see you guys on Monday morning for that. But now, uh, okay, so let's do, I, we might even end early. I don't know if I need the whole rest of, of the lecture time for this, but I wanted to just sort of wrap up a little bit and talk about some stuff you could do, like after the quarter's over, you know, going forward in, in CS or coding or whatever. Um, these first, I'm probably going to skip some of these first slides. This is just like, hey, what have we learned? Where have we come from? It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you were here. It's like, uh, you, ever, you ever watch one of these TV shows? Like, uh, my wife loves the Dr. Phil show, and she loves a lot of these trashy, like, talk shows, reality shows, or whatever. And those shows, what they love to do is they'll say, like, coming up, and they'll show you what's next. And then they'll go to commercial, and then they'll come back, and they'll say, just a minute ago, you saw this. So they're constantly showing you some shit that they're about to do or that they just did. And if you actually look at how much present tense content there is, there's like five minutes of content in these stupid shows. <laughs> so I feel like I'm doing that here. If I, hey, remember all the stuff we learned? So yeah, we learned a bunch of stuff. It was pretty cool. Uh, we learned about collections. We learned about how they're implemented on the inside. Uh, we learned about algorithms you can do on collections. We learned about recursion. Recursion is cool. Um, we learned a little bit about objects and OOP and inheritance and stuff. It's not very well implemented in C++, so we kind of de-emphasized it a little bit. So yeah, what can we do after this? I guess that's the big question. Um, I mean, the 106s are meant to be a foundation for you guys. You know, you're, you learn kind of the basic understanding of how programming works, loops and variables and arrays and data and, and methods and parameters and all that stuff. That's more 106A. And then our class was more like data and algorithms. Like, I have a big amount of data. What do I do with it? How do I store it? What kind of algorithms can I use to process it? I mean, we're, we're just barely starting on that journey, but that's kind of the plan. That's what we did. So now that you've finished this course, what can you do? Well, I mean, you can take the, if you want to do more coding, you can take 107. If you want to do theoretical computer science, you can take 103. Some of you guys, I think, are in that right now, right? Who's in 103 right now? Yeah, okay. Because you could take, it's a co-requisite with us. So you could be taking it right now, or you could take it next quarter. So these are kind of the two main courses people take next, 107 and 103. Uh, 107 is a bunch more coding, and 103 is a bunch more not coding. <laughs> Although I guess they had a little bit of coding this time, right? They made you do a little bit of coding in there. Yeah. Chocolate, peanut butter, put them together, whatever. Yeah, but it's mostly not coding in 103. So I want to talk about what those courses are a little bit, along with a bunch of other stuff. So, uh, I mean, those two, we kind of have these two tracks of knowledge in our core here, like the sort of systems and programming track, and we have a sort of theoretical and mathematical computer science track on the, on the right here. Um, so let's talk about 107 just for a second. I mean, I've got, I, I try to put some, some face pictures of who, <laughs> who teaches these classes generally. Um, so 107 is our computer organization and systems class. It's like, you know, inception, we're gonna go to a dream inside the dream, we gotta go deeper, kind of. That's what the plan is with 107. We gotta go closer to the hardware and really understand <laughs> some things deep down, like how does a computer actually compute stuff? How does it do arithmetic in the processor, like the instructions that it uses to calculate additions and multiplications and all these different oper operations, logic, if else, that kind of stuff. How does the processor actually like do that? So going down low, we'll understand sort of the raw machine instructions that it uses to do those things, along with the what's called assembly code, which is kind of a slightly above the computer language uh, that's you know very, very raw and basic. So you kind of learn how to write programs or, or read programs in that uh, format. You also learn the C programming language. So you know we've been doing C++ and I mean basically the C language is just C++ but a bunch of stuff taken out. <laughs> and um, in a weird way I actually like C a lot better than C++ because it's much simpler. There's just a lot less of it. There's a lot less features, you know, fewer features and fewer pieces of syntax you need to learn. So it's possible, I think it's possible to sort of master C and just really get the whole language of C. I don't know if C++ is masterable because it just has so much to it and there's so much crazy shit going on in C++. So C is a very low level programming language and actually some of the programs you write, you're being challenged to write these very simple things that you could have done easily in Java or C++. Like I remember when I took equivalent of this course when I was a college student, they had an assignment that was like to write selection sort on an array of strings. And I'm like, that sounds really easy. 
But in C, it's not easy. It's hard as hell. <laughs> so, because just strings are hard, and arrays are hard, and just all the computations that you take for granted in a higher level language like C++ or Java are more difficult to do in C. And so I, I think some students dislike that because it feels like an exercise in frustration. Why are, you, why are you making me build an entire house with just a hammer and nails when you could give me some better tools or something? But I think the idea is to really understand the steps of that computation deeply as opposed to sort of having a lot of magical helpers that help you do it for you. So anyway, you learn about coding kind of on a deeper, lower level. You learn a lot more about how code gets compiled and linked together and executed. All the, you know that build folder that you have with when you compile your project, all these .o files, and then it kind of becomes a executable program. And we just don't really talk about that very much in this class. You just uh, hit compile and hit run and that's it. You know, and in 107 they really kind of talk about what's going on there and how that process, how it works and stuff like that and how libraries get linked together and how compiled object files get linked together and all these interesting things and how code runs, like the way that the, the memory gets laid out in a program. When you run, run the program, when you have your stack and you have your heap and you have these different segments of data that you interact with, um, it's super interesting. And I think what a lot of people come out of 107 with is they just have a much better overall understanding of how programs run and how computers work and how, what programming is really about. So you know that's what we felt was the most important sort of next thing for you guys to learn in our curriculum. You also learn some kind of operating system stuff, like kind of how to get around in Unix a little bit, how to use version control to check in and check out of a, a project and this kind of stuff. So you'll be a lot better sort of overall programmer, I think, after 107, okay? Um, the knock on 107, there are a few things that people criticize. What have you guys heard about 107? What's the word on the street? That it's hard? The heap allocator programming assignment is hard. Listen, y'all been doing three assignments a week. You'll be fine, don't worry. <laughs> they only assign one assignment at a time. <laughs> so they, they don't know how hard you guys have had it. Uh, so you heard that that's hard, some of the project hard. What else you guys heard? I'm just curious. Yeah, go ahead. A lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. What else have you heard? A weed out class, that's an interesting way to phrase it, right? Like, what, weed out the people who aren't gonna cut it in the major or something like that, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if I agree with that characterization, but I've heard people say that before, like, um, I think I have a slide on that, where is that? Is that here, yeah. Um, <laughs> will 107 kill me? Um, so look, I, I wanna, I mean, maybe, I, how many of you guys are signed up to take it? I'm just curious. Uh, for next quarter. See, a lot of you already signed up for this class, right? So I don't think I need to like pitch this too hard here, but um, it does have a bit of this reputation. Super hard, takes a ton of time. Certain projects themselves have reputations. Um, it's a weed out course, right? I, I think that's a little bit overblown. I think part, let me tell you where I think that, that reputation mostly comes from. I think part of it is, is that they don't have a layer. They have TAs who have office hours. So you can go get help, instructor holds office hours, you know, you can get help in 107, but you know, the layer is just like open lots of hours, there's lots of people in there, there's just kind of this space you can go to at many different days, many different times, and just sit there for hours and get help on stuff, right? And you don't have quite that much access to helpers in 107, and I think that there are some students who really rely on this layer time to kind of get through 106. And then when that goes away, they really miss that and they struggle a little bit in 107. So I would say if you don't use the layer that much or if you go sometimes or you use that mixed with other resources like Piazza and email and section leader and that kind of thing, you're probably not gonna find that such a jarring transition. If you go to the layer a ton and you really feel like without the layer you're, you're struggling, then this might be a difficult transition. But I think that this is more of a like 106 A and B problem. I find most 106 X students don't find this transition to be quite as tough, because you guys are already facing a really challenging class right now that I'm, I'm subjecting you to, you know? So anyway, um, you have to do a little more of like helping yourself, like if you're stuck, you need to be able to go look at documentation, you might need to go Google some stuff or try out some stuff and kind of get yourself halfway unstuck and then ask the teacher or the TA or whoever to finish helping the rest of the way, getting you unstuck. And if you're capable of doing some of that, I think you should be fine. Um, but you know, I will say, I think the class is very well organized. These people, uh, Julie Zelensky is amazing, and Chris Gregg is also awesome, and they both have spent a lot of time really making the materials 
well crafted, well written. It's not a sloppy, buggy, broken course. Everything's real carefully set up. And they know mm -hmm. it's challenging, but they've had years to dial it up and down and figure out how challenging they want it to be. There's a lot of well-known questions and answers and bugs and fixes. And so like, they kind of know how to help you through the course. And so I think overall it's okay. It's tough and it does, I think what you heard was probably right. It does take a lot of time, but I don't think you guys are gonna drown in this class. If you're worried about that, I, I would say, you, I think you're probably gonna be okay. So I encourage you to give it a try. Now, um, okay, having said that, there is this other class, 107E. Yeah, some of you guys have heard about this course. Uh, that E stands for embedded. And this is basically a, a new version of 107 that is focused on writing programs that run on a Raspberry Pi uh, uh, board. I don't know if you guys know about these things, but they're just like crappy little cheap computers, basically, that have like the bare minimum hardware to like be computers, you know, like they have a, I think this is an old picture, but they have like an HDMI video port, and they have like a little USB port for a keyboard and a mouse, and you just sort of like hook up a hardware to it, a, a, a monitor and a, a keyboard to it, and then you push a power button somewhere and it boots up and it's this like kind of cheap little computer. And what's fun about working with this thing is that like you write a C program or a program in whatever language and your program is like the operating system of the Pi. The Pi turns on and it doesn't boot into a GUI of Windows or Linux or something, no, no, no. It just like immediately runs your main method. <laughs> like you are the operating system, there's nothing else happening on this device but you and your program. And so that's pretty interesting. And you learn a bunch of really cool stuff. Like for example, this thing has some like lights you can turn on and off and little beeps you can make. And to do them, you just like go to certain addresses in memory and like write values there. So if you go to this like, you know, memory 0x7ff and you put a, a two there, you'll hear beep. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> it reminds me of like if you tap someone's knee and then their leg kicks out. It's like this thing, you just like tap the memory in different places and lights go on and stuff. And um, you know, the stuff I said a minute ago about 107 being kind of lower level, that's even more true here. Because I mean, the regular 107, you're still coding on your laptop and you, you compile your program and you run it on your machine or on a you know, school server or whatever machine. So it's still kind of running on a normal computer, you know? Um, but this is like you're just programming for this different device. And you know, what, is this better? Is it worse? Is it harder? Is it easier? I don't know, it's kind of, it's different. You know, you learn a lot of the same stuff. But like, I think what you find here is like, the stuff that you get stuck on might be different. Like I was talking to a student last quarter who um, they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with their program and then they eventually discovered that there was like a short circuit in one of the pins of their Raspberry Pi and like the hardware was actually busted and it made their program not work properly and it wasn't a bug in their code. It was like this thing where they had to order a new little Pi or get a new one from the, from the box of Raspberry Pi. You know, it's like, that's not a bug that you would have in the normal 107. It's a weird little thing to have to deal with, you know. So anyway, or like sometimes your program doesn't work and so you turn on the thing and you just don't see anything because it tries to boot up and your thing doesn't work properly and it just explodes and it doesn't work. And it doesn't literally explode, but it, uh, anyway, you, you encounter some different kind of bugs and different kind of issues here. Um, so if you're trying to figure out which one that you might want to take, I mean, I think they're both interesting classes. I don't have a, a suggestion of particular preference, but I think most people take 107. That's still the main one that most people take. Um, 107 is more polished. It's been around longer. The materials are very like chiseled out and they're very, the, the bug rate is very low in the 107 content. You know, it's been used for years. 107E is newer. It's a little more like rough. You know, they don't always have quite as many detailed guides for everything. You sometimes have to figure out a little more stuff on your own or you and your buddies have to figure it out kind of. There's a little more of that uh, going on. But I mean, you have this neat like context that you get to learn about. I think if you're interested in embedded computing or devices or this kind of thing, E could be really cool. Uh, you do have to fill out an application to get into E. In fact, they might have already chosen for this current quarter. But um, so that's the difference between those two courses. I think they're both really interesting. And uh, actually, I think it's especially interesting that I believe Julie Zielinski is teaching E next quarter, and she's like the queen of 107 ecosystem. So I'm sure she'll do a great job. Um, did you guys have any other questions about 107 or 107E while they're on the screen here? Yeah. Can you compare the expected amount of time for 107 with 106X? Oh, okay, uh, 107, the, how much time does it take to do 107 versus 106X? <laughs> um, well, I've heard from most students who take A, B, 
106 a and then 106 b they have told me that 107 is a jump up a pretty significant a noticeable jump up for them but uh, most of the students I talked to who came out of X, they said it felt more flat or maybe just a little jump up for 107. And actually, frankly, for you guys, I've given you more homework than I've ever given anyone in a 106 course before. So you, <laughs> so you guys might be like, this isn't so bad in 107. It's only one assignment, not three. I actually feel really bad for you guys. You know, usually these homeworks are just one part. And I was like, screw it, I'm going to give them three parts. And at first, it was just something I did on homework one to scare out people who should switch to B. But then I was like, well, maybe I'll just do it on all of the assignments. I was just curious if all of you would drop or not. And I, a lot of you stayed. I was weird. I don't know. I legit thought you would mutiny and like stab me by week four. But um, oh well, there's still time. I get it. I heard you loud and clear. Uh, all right, that's, that's unpleasant. No, but sorry, so I don't know if I really, I can't totally speak to that because I do think there is one thing that happens in 106 where the people who come to 106, they come from all different kind of places. Some of you guys had never coded before uh, spring or summer or whatever. And some of you have been on your high school robotics team and you've been writing apps for iPhone when you were 12 and it's just, it's all over the map, right? And so when you get here, the amount of work that this class was for you or the amount of work 106A or B was for you could be all over the place. And for some of you, it's not that bad because you've seen some of the material before or even all the material, you took AP or whatever and you saw a lot of this stuff. And so that means that your experience in here is hard for me to know what it was exactly. And most of you haven't seen a lot of this regular 107 or 107E material before. So like that can be a real difference for students where they didn't realize that part of why 106 was this many hours a week for them was because they already knew recursion or they already knew binary trees or whatever, you know? So I think it's totally doable. I guess what I would say in general is it's a, it's a challenging class, so don't sign up for like this and four other hard classes all at the same time. Um, that would be my suggestion. But it's not gonna destroy your life. You'll be all right, even the heap allocator. Um, any other questions about 107 or E? I don't know everything about these classes. I don't usually teach them, but I, I'm happy to try to answer what I can. Yeah? Um, since computer science mostly about building abstractions with each other, after 107 or 110, how much of that carries on to other aspects of computer science? Yeah, good question. Like, what about abstractions and like layers? This seems like we're going down, down, deeper into the computer. Now, I'll confess to you, I think every computer scientist has areas of the field they find more interesting or less interesting, and that's okay. We don't all like the same stuff. I personally am really into like writing apps that face a user. I love writing web pages. I love writing mobile apps. I'm frankly less interested in like the bits and the bytes and the beeps and the boops. And like, I probably wouldn't take E because I'm never gonna wanna program one of these things. But that, I don't wanna like influence you guys. Like that's, that's a cool little gizmo and I just happen to be more of a up high kind of guy and then not down low in the hardware kind of guy. But I don't wanna bias you to think that too. You know, so for me, uh, I'm more interested in going up from C++. I don't wanna worry about pointers and deleting and freeing memory. I wanna worry about like, animation and 3D and UIs and this kind of stuff. But uh, if you want to learn that, we have that too. It's just that this is what we do first. Like I think everybody, every university, every CS curriculum has to decide like what comes next after introductory programming. And different schools go different ways. It honestly kind of depends on the people who really have the power in the department. What they did as their PhD is kind of like, <laughs> so our systems faculty is powerful. And so they're like, we're doing this next, you know? Some universities, they have a really powerful theory group. And so they're like, everyone has to take 103 <laughs> equivalent right after intro. You know, like that's kind of, that's how these departments sort of do things. Um, okay, so that's 107 and 107E. You could potentially take those next quarter. There's also, I want to talk about 103 for a minute. This is the Math Foundations of Computing, the theoretical branch of CS. Um, much more of a pencil and paper class as opposed to a computer and code class. And some people like that and some people like that less. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a totally different <laughs> aspect of our field. But I will say, I think this is really, really important stuff. I mean you think about really big questions in this class. I mean, you start out learning things like about, about some proof techniques and math techniques and counting and sets and different things that are fundamental to logic and computer science, but you also learn about things like algorithms and the limits of computing, what you can and can't compute and how fast you can do it and what you, what you can do. And there's a lot of interesting fundamentals here 
that really are most of the core of what computer science really is. Um, I've heard this great quote that's, uh, if, I forget if it's a Dijkstra quote, where it's, um, the quote is, uh, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes, right? It's like a, just a tool that we use to learn about something, right? So um, this class, I think, represents that because we're thinking about the ideas behind computing and programming and how computers work. And, um, you know, there's this really, there's a lot of really, really interesting big problems that you talk about in our theory courses. Uh, one of them is this famous P versus NP. Have you guys ever heard of that before? P versus NP? Maybe if you took 103, you heard about it a little bit. Um, <laughs> short answer is it's a question about sort of what types of problems computers can solve in a reasonable amount of time and whether these two different big categories of problems are the same as each other or different. And we can't decide, we can't prove that one way or the other yet. We're working on that. And if we were able to make a proof one way or the other about that problem, that would be a really, really big milestone and we would use that to make all sorts of other breakthroughs. And these are like open problems. I think one of the coolest things about CS is that we haven't figured it all out yet. We haven't got all the answers yet. And so this material is a great example of that. So super interesting and it helps that the people who teach these classes really know what they're doing. Keith Schwartz is maybe the best instructor in the university, not even just in the department, and he's often the instructor here. And Cynthia Lee is also amazing and she's teaching it as well. I think they're doing the course together next quarter, so I think that's gonna be really awesome. Um, anyway, this is a different take on CS. You don't write, it used to be that you wouldn't really write any code in this class, but I believe recently they've added a little bit of code, mostly as an illustration of like, let's learn this theoretical concept and then real quick write a little piece of code to verify that or illustrate that. But it's mostly not about writing new code. Um, so some of you are in that class right now. Did I sum that up okay? Like would you, would you want to add something about what that class is or what it was like to be in that class? Anybody want to jump in and help me out? It's so good. I did not. I did not pay her to be here. It's a real Stanford student. So good. Why? Why is it so good? I can't ask for a better plug than that. <laughs> if I ever get a blood transfusion from another educator, I want it to be Keith Schwartz's blood. <laughs> because something's going on with him. He's got a ton of good energy. If I could get a little of that, I'd love to steal a little bit of that from him. Uh, he's an amazing instructor. He, he's a great lecturer, and he cares a lot, and he writes great assignments. And Yeah, he's awesome. He and Cynthia are going to do a great job next quarter in 103. Um, so, you know, some students avoid 107 because they think it'll be too hard. Some students avoid 103 because they don't want to learn this mathy, proofy theory stuff. Don't worry, they're both interesting and they're both uh, worthwhile and you'll, you'll do fine in them, you'll be interested in them. Um, there's a whole bunch of other CS courses that uh, follow. You typically want to take your 107 and your 103 next, I would say, but then a lot of stuff opens up after that. Like once you know a little bit of the foundational stuff, you can take a lot of other, the, the, the tree of dependencies kind of opens up a lot at that point. Um, you could take 108, which is like building bigger apps in Java, like learning about how to write. You, you know, most of these programs we've written aren't that big in terms of how many files and classes and relationships there are. I mean, maybe Stanford 123 starts to have a lot, but 108, you really do bigger stuff and take more time, more weeks. You can work with teams and stuff. And I believe nowadays they have some Android app stuff in there too. So you kind of learn how to make bigger real apps in there. That's pretty cool. Um, 109 is the next theory course, Intro to Probability. Really gives you a lot of good instincts about probability and stats that we use in CS. Uh, Chris Peach teaches that. He's also a phenomenal instructor. Uh, I envy a lot of these, these other uh, colleagues of mine. Uh, I love web dev, so you can take that. That's 142. You, they want you to take 107 before you take web dev, just because they kind of want you to have those programming muscles from 107, and they want you to know Unix and Git and all that kind of stuff. Um, HCI is really cool. You design and spec out and you, know, you, you come up with the plan and the design and the, the UI for a big app and then you spend most of the whole quarter building it in a team, which is really neat. Uh, so you, that's the kind of class where you, you build your own project, you don't follow someone else's project spec. And then when you're done with it, you get to like show it off to people and you actually can go to job interviews and tell them about it and stuff like that. So um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I want to mention a couple course numbers that you might not think to look at. Uh, we have this course number 193, which is sort of a, 
catch-all course number where we cover special topics. This is like if somebody just randomly says, hey, I want to teach a um, big data course in spring. It takes a bit of work to go submit a new course number and get it on a schedule. So they just call it 193 and they just put it in there and they say section X is the big data class taught by Professor Jones or whatever. So in any given quarter, if you just go looking in there, there might be some cool stuff that's only offered that quarter or that year. Some of it recurs. Uh, there's a, a particular one, 193P, which is iPhone app development course, which everybody likes. And if you have an iPhone or take, if you want to develop apps for an iPhone, that's a great class to take. Again, a lot of these classes require 107 as a prereq, so you want to take that first. Um, some of them will let you jump over 107, but mostly they don't want you to skip because they expect you to know some of that, that other material. There's also a class, uh, unfortunately it's only offered in, usually in the fall, but it's called CS9, it's prepping for interviews. You might want to watch for that next fall. It's a whole class where you practice interview problems. It'd be great for getting internships sophomore year. Um, there's also, if you want to look at the course numbers that are less than 100, the two-digit course numbers, these are often courses that are presented by students. And you might say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want to trust like a student to make a course. But this tends to be people who were like section leaders or former SLs and they were like so into teaching that they're like, I want to just like make up my own whole class now. And they often do a pretty decent job and some of them keep repeating and they have the hand them down to another student when that person graduates. And so some of these classes have been offered like 10 times. There's ones about um, JavaScript and Python. It's a great place to pick up like a little skill, like a language or something. There's uh, yeah, web programming. There's all kind of little stuff down there. So don't sleep on the like sub uh, 100 course numbers. And actually one that I should have listed but I, I omitted was there's, I believe it's numbered CS50, which is CS for social good, which is like, hey, can we use tech to actually like help people? That would be kind of nice. And so you can take a whole class on figuring out how to help with that, which I think is a great thing to do. And that's, that's student driven as well. So there's a lot of good courses like south of 100. Go check those out. So anyway, yeah, all this sort of opens up to you once you get out of 107. You could look at a lot of these for spring or next fall or something like that. Okay. Um, any questions about these or about any of the other courses so far that I've been showing? Just trying to give you a menu of things you could go do after this, you know? Okay. The, the best part is all these courses are taught by great people. These are people who care about teaching. They run good classes. I'm just proud to, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, like, don't take 109 in the spring or whatever because Jones is teaching it. And, you know, I don't have to, like, pass those kind of notes to you guys. These are all great people. They do a good job. Um, if you fi fall in love with CS, maybe some of you already have. Uh, we have a major. <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could major in this if you want to. Uh, <laughs> we're basically the, arguably the number one uh, CS ranked department. Now I will say those rankings are kind of bullshit because that's basically based on research. So the fact that they rank us number one, that's because we published some paper in some conference somewhere. That's probably not what you most care about, which is like, are the classes good? Am I gonna get a good experience here? That's really what you probably care about as a student. But I will say, I think that we, they don't have a rating for that, but I would be bold enough to say, I think if they did, we would get number one in that too. Because, um, and I know I'm biased, but I, I think uh, uh, up and down the faculty, a lot of them care a lot about teaching. And frankly, there's a lot of schools where that isn't true. Um, where they care more about their research and about their grants and their funding and you guys are like the last priority. I don't think that's true here in general. I'm proud to work with all these great people. Um, the students here are awesome, lots of energy. And just look, the economy, the tech sector is awesome right now. It's a great time to major in CS. There's lots of jobs, lots of research, lots of opportunities. Um, if you're not quite as sold on this or you're already majoring in something else or your parents won't let you major in CS or whatever, <laughs> I know that's how it goes sometimes. You can minor in CS. All you got to do is finish 103, 107, and then another theory course, and then you take two more, and you're done. <coughs> it's not that bad. You minor in CS. That, that'll get you a lot of places. You can also, uh, if you're going to finish some other degree, you're almost done. Maybe you can consider doing a grad, you know, master's, a co-terminal master's degree in our department. Even if you came from some other department, you can still do that with us. We got a whole bunch of other majors that are like CS mixed with other things. Um, you know, SimSys is a lot of different disciplines like linguistics and psychology and AI. Uh, there's MCS, which is like math kind of mixed with CS mostly. There's MS and E, which is kind of some management and business stuff mixed with CS. There's EE, there's all these, all these degrees that like, you know, if you kind of are buying what I'm selling, but you don't quite want to change your whole life over to CS, we got a lot of options. <laughs> come one, come all. You know, we're, we have lots of choices here for you if you want to do more of this. 
Or if you don't want to do any of these things, just taking a couple more classes still looks good on your resume. So, you know, the more you know is, is better. Uh, a question, yeah. People keep talking about census, and I still don't understand what it is. Like, how is it different from CS? It's CS plus site plus it, in, what, <laughs> in what sense is it? Can you just, like, take CS classes and also psychology classes? Like, how are those connected? It's, I find SimSys hard to describe concisely as well, but it's a mixture of several different fields where you're focusing on like symbols and languages and communication and intelligence and things like this. And so you study things like natural language processing, like how do you look at sentences and understand their meaning? You study linguistics, both spoken and computing languages, like what are some of the interesting properties of languages? You study like how people and computers interact how uh, you know the Turing test, making bots and systems that emulate human behavior patterns. You do a lot of stuff like that, and it kind of just brings a lot of these different disciplines together. It's meant to be for people who have interest in lots of different areas, and they like CS, but they don't just want to take CS everything every quarter. And I mean, we have a lot of different majors like that that are sort of us plus other stuff, and that that can be really uh, really interesting stuff. Um, I mean, I encourage you to go, go Google more about it if you want, or we can talk about it more after class. I've only got a minute or two left, so let me just say one or two more things. Um, if you want to learn more, here's some really rapid fire stuff. I just have to finish in just one or two minutes here, but if you just want to do more, there's lots of like online courses you could go watch, like on uh, you know, Coursera or Stanford YouTube lectures. There's lots of these websites where you can practice code exercises, like I wrote one, as you know, but there's other ones, like uh, there's ones called like Hacker Rank, where you hack and do code problems. There's lots of cool ones where you can earn points and do challenges every week and stuff, and it's a good way to keep your coding skills fresh. Um, if you want an internship, <laughs> there's lots of things you could do. Um, our course material is pretty heavily covered on internship uh, interviews and stuff. Go to the, the computer forum, which is our main industry connection. If you declare for the major or if you go to these guys and go to their website and sign up for their mailing list, they send a lot of like industry job announcements and stuff out and you'll start getting those. Now you might say, well, I'm just a freshman or I've only taken X, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. And Okay, like some of them want more experience than what you have. There are a bunch of companies that have internships for freshmen. I don't have a lot of time, but on the slides here are a bunch of them with links to applications and another slide for more. There's a whole bunch of jobs that want freshmen or want people who just did introductory stuff. They want you to apply for these. If you want something to do this summer, go look at these slides later and click on some of this stuff. There's a whole bunch more. Just Google for CS freshman internships. They, call, they often call them freshman internships. Even if you're not a freshman, that basically is code for like, I've only taken two or three classes, but I want to do an internship, basically. Um, yeah, the last thing I'll say is the great thing about CS is you can teach yourself a lot of stuff. So if you want something to do over break, Go teach yourself how to make a HTML page or something. Just it doesn't take that long. You can figure it out. Or go Google like how to rewrite a, one of your homeworks in uh, Python or something. Just if you want some little project, do something real simple. Probably teach yourself something. So I'm out of time. So I just wanted to say thanks a lot. You guys are a great class. I'll see you on Monday. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Oh, okay, I canceled the final. Everybody gets an A. I love you guys. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> Thanks. See you Monday, guys. Thank you. <clears throat>